Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today uh, to tell you a little bit about the natural history of uh, the Ebola virus in Central Africa. I uh, also want to thank Janice for inviting me here. Um, I think it's very uh, good to uh, put together all this panel of experts who can uh, really give uh, everybody a broad picture about all the aspects related to Ebola spread, Ebola control, and uh, vaccination and treatments and everything. It's great, even for me, I learned a lot today. Um, so as you can see on this map, uh, you can see on this map the location of 23 of the 24 uh, Ebola outbreaks uh, observed in Africa since 1976. Uh, the first outbreak was recorded in Yambuku in northern DRC, and uh, subsequent outbreaks occurred in Congo, in Sudan, in Uganda, in, uh, in the Republic of the Congo, in Gabon, and now in West Africa. And uh, as you can see, all these outbreaks seem, seem to, or most of them at least, seem to occur in a forested area. You can see on the right side of this slide, um, uh, the, in green, the Central African forest and West African forest. And uh, this is actually where we observe most of the outbreaks. There are a few exceptions in Uganda and in Sudan, but um, otherwise most of the outbreaks were really observed in a, in a tropical forest or near tropical forests. And every single of the observed outbreak uh, was uh, started in a rural area, not in major cities. Uh, and if you look at the temporal distribution now, instead of the spatial distribution of the 24, uh, 23 actually outbreaks uh, observed in Africa, you can see that there are some gaps uh, sometimes between uh, between the uh, did here yeah between uh, consecutive outbreaks. So the first one, first cluster of outbreaks in Sudan and Congo were observed in the late 70s, and then for 15 years no outbreaks occurred, and then some more in the mid 90s uh, in DRC and uh, and Congo and uh, in Gabon sorry, and then in Uganda and then again in Congo and Gabon and then uh, finally a new cluster of outbreaks more recently. But there are long periods during which there's absolutely no human outbreaks. So what happens in the meantime? And actually, we focus you know, 99% of our efforts in controlling and understanding what's happening during human outbreaks. But this is irrelevant, epidemiologically speaking. This is not the life of the virus. It's a dead end for him. It's an accident. So from our perspective, it's super important. It, it takes all our energy, and it has a very, very strong impact, obviously, on human populations. But from the virus's perspective, I may say, uh, this is a mistake. Okay, so if we want to understand where the virus is, what it does, and how it affects human eventually, human populations eventually, we need to really focus on what's going on when we do nothing. Okay? And maybe we should do something when we do nothing. <laughs> and this is actually the main purpose of my talk today, trying to uh, uh, maybe shed a little bit of light on what might happen in the forest uh, where we do not do much, unfortunately. And uh, so first, what do we know about Ebola host species? And species here is plural. Um, there are many host species. There are many species that are sensitive to Ebola, that can, are susceptible to Ebola, that can be infected, and uh, a lot of them die. So a lot of the hosts that are contaminated with Ebola die eventually, but some survive, and depends on the species. And uh, what we know is that in humans, uh, the virus um, survives for a very short period in a, in a single human being. The incubation period is about six days on average, a bit longer sometimes, a bit shorter sometimes. And, uh, and then there is usually uh, about a week of symptomatic infectious period. And that's actually pretty short for the virus. And uh, the virus doesn't spread very well in uh, human populations because it's actually too virulent. It kills its hosts, which is kind of stupid if you think about it. And uh, so the uh, human outbreaks are like this. It's basically for the virus, the virus spreads pretty fast, but eventually, since it kills its hosts, uh, it disappears. And uh, it's actually the same for every virus as to virulent. A virus that kills its host does not survive in the long term. This is why we often observe actually in very virulent uh, viruses that switch, switch hosts, uh, we observe along, you know, after years and years of evolution, uh, a decrease in virulence. Okay? But it's not interesting for the virus to, uh, to kill its host really fast. It's also not interesting for the virus to make its host healthy, okay? Don't get me wrong. A sick host is good for the virus but a dead host is useless. Um, we also know that uh, Ebola can infect several other species. Uh, that includes primates, of course. We are primates, as you all know. We are actually great apes. Uh, and, uh, but the virus can also infect uh, other species that are unrelated to us or remotely related to us, uh, like dikers. These are small antelopes living in the forest in Central Africa, actually everywhere in Africa. Um, pigs can also be infected, so I'm uh, 
big bush pigs live in Central Africa everywhere, and they probably get infected once in a while. Uh, fruit bats, obviously, as uh, Kevin uh, told you about earlier today. And there's probably a, a bunch of other species that can be infected and either are highly susceptible like us and die and are actually deadened for the virus, or maybe can keep the virus a bit longer and contribute to spread the virus uh, over a longer period of time. Um, and uh, what we also know is that Ebola antibodies uh, have been found in, uh, in several human populations, including populations that have never been affected by uh, symptomatic Ebola outbreaks, if I may say. Uh, so, for example, if I, there has been studies in, Centra, in the Central African Republic about the, in the Bayaka pygmies, uh, shouldn't call them pygmies, are the Bayaka people actually, and um, and these people, it was found that up to 13 or 14 percent of the pygmies of the Bayaka had uh, antibodies against Ebola, and it was also found that in the same area, people who actually do not rely as much on the forest, uh, so non-Bayaka people had. These people, only 4% of them were positive, seropositive to Ebola. That's really very interesting. Uh, it means that if you live in the virus for a long time, you may be eventually positive to Ebola. Not necessarily developing symptoms. And having these Bayaka uh, having antibodies doesn't mean they are resistant to Ebola either. Uh, it just means they've been exposed to something that we detect as an antibody uh, uh, against Ebola. But in fact, it can actually be an antibody against a strain of Ebola that we don't know and that is not virulent and doesn't kill its host. It's very likely. There's probably thousands of uh, viruses that we don't know about in this area. And I bet there is dozens of filoviruses uh, living in this area in Central African Republic that we don't know about. Actually, we probably know less than 0.1% of all the viruses living in this area. And uh, this is something we have to keep in mind that we are looking at only a tiny a uh, fraction of the, of the viruses, of the filoviruses that probably live in this, uh, in this area over there. We only see the, uh, one, the, the submerged part of the, ice, of the iceberg. And uh, same results were found in other hosts. Uh, we found bats that are positive to Ebola in Bangladesh, obviously, um, but also in Ghana and uh, in Gabon, everywhere, even in areas where there hasn't been no human outbreaks or even no uh, outbreaks recorded in wild uh, chimpanzees and gorillas. Um, antibodies to, uh, against, uh, directed against Ebola were also found in dogs and uh, in major cities in Gabon where there's absolutely no reason why there should be uh, Ebola because we haven't observed Ebola outbreaks in humans, 9% uh, of the dogs are seropositive to, uh, to Ebola. So there are definitely some viruses circulating around there that we don't know about. Okay? Some scientists don't recognize it, some actually do recognize it, it's actually something that's currently evolving in the field. Um, but I, I bet, I rate to bet a lot of money that we will find soon in the future some unknown Ebola viruses or Ebola related viruses that are not uh, dangerous for humans. Um, but, anyways, uh, let's keep moving. So, when you look at the spread, when you try to investigate the spread of uh, what happens during these gaps between two human outbreaks, uh, there are different hypotheses. And uh, actually, if I simplify, there are two main hypotheses that have been put, put forward by researchers. The first one is called the multiple transmission events uh, hypothesis, if I may say, from the reservoir. So this, according to this hypothesis, um, uh, which is described in this paper from 2004, so that's before we even knew what was the reservoir for the Ebola virus. Um, according to this hypothesis, there, there are some species, or maybe several species, that can carry the virus. And in these species, there are many, many strains of Ebola virus. And uh, sometimes there are contacts between these species and human populations, and that triggers an Ebola outbreak. If this hypothesis is true, you expect to actually observe during each Ebola outbreak, human Ebola outbreak, a different strain, because there are so many of them circulating in the, in the host species, in the reservoir species. Um, and actually, this hypothesis was uh, uh, explained and presented um, because it was found that during a bunch of different uh, epidemic chains corresponding to outbreaks occurring at the border between Gabon and uh, Congo in the early 2000s, uh, several different types of viruses were observed. So it was argued by the, the virologists who actually led the study that all these viruses come from the, are different and they come from the reservoir and uh, so they are definitely multiple introductions of, uh, of the virus in human populations. And I will talk about it later and say that maybe it's not true. Um, according to the second hypothesis, a single Ebola Zaire, so I'm focusing here on Ebola Zaire, one of the five strains of Ebola, 
uh, a single Ebola Zika outbreak has been spreading across Central Africa since the, since the beginning. You know, maybe before 1976, maybe since 1976, I don't know. But that's the hypothesis of these researchers who published their research in PLOS Biology a few years ago. And uh, the rationale behind this uh, hypothesis is that uh, if you look at the, uh, what's called the phylogenetic tree of Ebola sequences, you know, Ebola is an RNA virus, it contains uh, something similar to our DNA, and uh, this genetic material evolves <coughs> through mutations, and as mutation accumulates, uh, you expect to, uh, the, to see the virus changing. And what you, what you see on this uh, phylogenetic tree is that it seems like all the outbreaks, you see the year of the outbreak written behind, uh, just next to the location, uh, all the outbreaks seems to branch earlier on the phylogenetic tree than a more recent outbreaks. So it's almost as if there is one strain uh, of Ebola that has evolved, accumulating mutation through time, and uh, as you go uh, through time, you see the, the longer branches correspond to more recent uh, Ebola outbreaks. Okay, so that's, that was the argument. The other argument is that uh, if you look at the location, so here's longitude of the different outbreaks observed in uh, Gabon Congo, you can see that there is a, a relationship between uh, time and location. It's like it's spread spatially. All right, so you've got this. Uh, it looks like there is some sort of uh, direction in the evolution of the different strains observed, and uh, also there is a spatial spread. So it's like there is basically a, a spread of Ebola through Central Africa. And actually, these uh, authors pushed even the, their, their argument a bit further and uh, did a regression uh, showing uh, the distance to, uh, to the first Ebola outbreaks ever observed in, uh, in the Congo in 1976 to the most recent one, and they argue that there was actually a spatial spread throughout Central Africa. And, uh, and uh, so that's why they claimed. Uh, these two hypotheses, uh, or the authors of these two hypotheses, have been fighting for a long time, and I'm sure if you put them in the same room, you'll see a lot of, uh, of um, energy going on. Um, but uh, I have been in rooms with them, and, uh, but I want them to get along, and I'm going to try to reconcile them. <laughs> okay, so first I want to say that the first hypothesis is wrong. Probably, because if the multiple introduction hypothesis was true, how could we explain the spatial spread of Ebola? Okay, this is here, the data are there. There is a spatial spread of Ebola, at least uh, in the early 2000s, this uh, series of outbreaks were observed in Gabon and Congo. There seemed to be a spread of Ebola, it's pretty convincing. And um, secondly, if the single outbreak hypothesis is true, how can we explain the available genetic data? All right? And actually since then, since the publication of this paper, there has been uh, two other outbreaks uh, in um, near Kiku in southern uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo in occidental Kasai, and uh, and if you look at where these outbreaks branch on the nice phylogenetic tree I, I told you about earlier, you see that it doesn't branch at all at the end. It, it, it seems to come from the very beginning of the tree, so it doesn't fit. So there are some mismatch here. Okay, these mismatches that you observe are not a very firm disproof. Of, uh, of the hypothesis, uh, because there are actually other factors that may shape this tree a little bit differently from what ex what's expected, including positive selection and other things. So I'm not going to uh, give a very firm answer here, but at least we should uh, express some doubts when it comes to these two hypotheses. And um, what I want to say here is that none of these hypotheses alone can explain the observed data. And uh, I think one, uh, one reason why these hypotheses are far from being perfect is because they do not explain us what's going on between this fictitious reservoir that we know nothing about and human outbreaks. It just postulates a lot of things and it uses some data collected during human outbreaks to try to understand what happens when there's no human outbreaks. So maybe we should actually look at what's happening uh, outside of human outbreaks. And I'm going to uh, bring here some insights from uh, 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 that I got from uh, the observation and the uh, the analysis of data collected during an Ebola outbreak <coughs> in Borrelis. Uh, so this took place at the border, close to the border to uh, Gabon in the in, uh, Republic of the Congo in Zala National Park uh, a few years ago, in 2004 actually. And um, at this time, um, actually in November 2013, uh, 2003, so just a couple of months uh, before these outbreaks occurred in Borrelis, uh, there was an outbreak in, in the human population in the village of, of Mbomo in the uh, in, uh, Republic of the Congo. And in that village, uh, I think 29 people died 
out of 32 cases or something like this uh, in just a month. And uh, luckily, if I may say, not more people die. And uh, I have to here uh, say that it's probably thanks to the work of, uh, of cultural anthropologists who went to this area the year before and uh, really did a great job educating people and sensitizing them to uh, what measures they should take in case of any, in the case of an Ebola outbreak. And at this time, it was actually the third Ebola outbreak affecting these population, these human populations, and they knew what to do. And uh, when I went to this village during the outbreak, I, nobody wanted to touch me. I mean, it was very clear. We were like tapping our fingers to say hi at a distance instead of shaking hands. And uh, people are really enforcing and respecting, and actually some of them are having fun changing their habits uh, to, to control and fight the virus. And they could see they were winning against the virus, so they were actually very happy. Um, anyways, um, so a couple of months uh, later, I was in the forest, uh, tens of uh, miles away from this, uh, this village, and uh, I was doing my PhD work, my dissertation, uh, observing gorillas in the forest clearing. Uh, that attracts actually a lot of these gorillas. And you can see here four pictures of the clearing with different animals. These are colobus monkeys. I'm sorry, you cannot see them well. And this is the group of gorillas with a silver background in the middle. Um, they are actually leaking the soil in this clearing, which is uh, rich in salt. And uh, here you can see some buffalo, some gorillas, and here again, some gorillas. And uh, so I did observe actually a lot of gorillas. And each time I observed the gorillas, I would um, obviously take pictures of them uh, because I like them and also because I wanted to identify them. So I took pictures of their face, and uh, I learned to identify gorillas just like we identify humans. And uh, it's actually not more difficult once your brain is trained to do this uh, task. So you can see they have different faces, and uh, you can actually tell them apart after a little while. And uh, using this uh, method, I was able to identify uh, over 360 gorillas, different gorillas, uh, in just two or three months. So that was actually a, a pretty massive work, but uh, it worked pretty well. And uh, so the kind of data I actually put together was um, this kind of data. I had for each gorilla group that would visit the curing, you know gorillas live in groups, and uh, sometimes males can be solitary, but females are always in groups. And uh, the kind of data I had was basically a line of zeros and ones uh, for each gorilla group, and um, each uh, line corresponds to a group. And each column here corresponds to one particular observation day. So if I observe a group on a particular day, I put a one in this uh, matrix, otherwise I put a zero. So I had this matrix of this binary matrix of zeros and ones. That's the kind of data I collected. And I'm not going to explain you how to analyze this, but basically it's called a capture my recapture data set. And uh, there are methods to analyze this kind of data sets. And actually we developed epidemiological models that fit this data very well. And, uh, and that was convenient because in 2004, like I said, an Ebola outbreak affected the study population. Um, that was very sad, of course, and that was also uh, uh, dramatic for uh, and a high risk for human populations who actually spend a lot of time in the forest. Uh, this time in the forest, there were gorilla carcasses, and there were chimpanzee car carcasses like this one, also uh, animals dying from Ebola. Uh, most of the known gorilla population uh, disappeared in a few months, and uh, I could only see, see them disappearing from the clearing. Um, the forest wasn't covered with, uh, with uh, corpses. Uh, it was actually far from there. I found a few, I found actually six uh, dead bodies, but that's not that many, given that probably hundreds of thousands of gorillas disappeared in this period. Um, because of the very fast decay rate of carcasses in tropical forests. Um, but two questions were asked at this time, and I tried to answer them. The first was uh, about the susceptibility uh, to Ebola of the different gorillas, the solitary, solitary gorillas of the group living individuals. And I tried to find out if they were equally susceptible. The prediction was that if Ebola spreads between gorillas uh, within a group, I would expect animals living in group to be more sensitive than animals uh, living solitarily. Just because if you live in group, if one of the members of your group gets infected by chance, then you will also sooner or later get the disease because of the proximity between individuals. The second uh, thing I wanted to look at was uh, the way gorillas get infected. I didn't know exactly what was going on. And to do that, I had my data set, my zeros and ones. And, uh, and uh, I tried to understand how I could extract information from these lines of zeros and ones. And uh, this is actually uh, the, the way we did it. We modeled, uh, we tested different models and tried to see if the, the data observed uh, could be explained better by one model versus the other. And this is the kind of uh, the conceptual models we tested. Um, the first hypothesis, uh, the multiple introduction from the reservoir hypothesis 
is the following. Basically, we've got gorillas, chimpanzees, tigers, and other wildlife that is susceptible to, to the virus in the forest. The reservoir, now we know it's fruit bats, but at this time we didn't. And uh, hunters, human populations, you know, who live in the forest, who need the forest to be, actually. And, um, and the first hypothesis was that uh, the, the, role, the reservoir plays a key role, and uh, all this wildlife gets contaminated from the reservoir, independent introductions, multiple strains, etc. And then human populations get you know, contaminated by hunting these animals or eating, actually, sometimes even dead animals found in the forest, uh, which happen, happens quite a lot over there. Um, the second hypothesis uh, is that there is actually an important secondary transmission after maybe one event of introduction from the reservoir. And so the reservoir only plays a role once and then you forget about it. And, uh, and then a, a spread of Ebola through the gorilla graded population, just like it happens in human populations. Okay, that's the second hypothesis. And um, so we built a model and uh, you know, we translated this into equations and fit the model to the data to estimate the parameters and try to see if the model predicted well the observed data or not. And this is roughly what we observed. The dots here correspond um, somehow to the data, the raw data. Okay? And the lines that you can see, the red and the blue line, correspond to um, um, the, the prediction of the model. And um, there is one series of data points that corresponds to the group living individuals in red, and one series of data points that corresponds to the solitary living individuals in, uh, in blue. So first, when you look at the raw data and the estimate of the survival, uh, the, the variation of the survival between 2002 and 2005, you can see that the, an animal alive in 2002 had uh, something like a 70% chance to still be there in 2004, and then there is a huge drop because it has only uh, uh, close to zero, actually, percent chance to be alive at the end of 2004 if it was a group living individual, and about 10-15% chance to be still alive at the uh, end of 2004 for um, a solitary living individual. So this drop in the, in the survival of the animals correspond to the outbreak. Okay? So the Ebola outbreaks happen during this period here uh, that you can very, uh, see very well. Um, and what you can also see on this data is that the model uh, fits very well the data. Okay? The model actually explains very, very well what happened uh, in the population. Um, so first result, there is definitely a higher survival of solitary individuals, which means that there is probably an important transmission of Ebola within gorilla groups, just like it happens within human families. Ebola is a, is a disease that really uses the, the social bonds between human uh, belonging to the same family. That's how it, uh, it progresses and, uh, and uh, kills so many people um, uh, currently in the past. Um, but also we can see that there is very likely a between group spread of the virus. So the second model, the second hypothesis is definitely supported by this model. Okay. Um, and uh, another thing we found is that since all the solitary males, uh, all the, sorry, all the females living group, but part of the males, adult males, live solitarily, we expected more males to survive than females, right? And that's actually what we observed. Before the outbreak, we had more females in the population than males, um, which is pretty usual for a, a great ape. It's even the case in humans. And, uh, but after uh, the outbreak, the sex ratio of the population got reversed. Uh, we actually had more males and females just because the females were completely wiped out um, by the Ebola outbreak due to their social behavior. So the gregarious individuals, the social animals, uh, died much earlier than the, the non-gregarious ones. So, at the end of this study, I know a little bit more uh, what's going on in the forest outside of uh, human outbreaks, or maybe at the same time as human outbreaks occur, right? And uh, can we try to uh, put all this information together? Uh, first, let's imagine what happens during this between group transmission. Uh, when, this, when the outbreak spreads in a gorilla group, uh, we know gorillas pretty well, we've been studying them for a long time. Uh, I myself have been uh, observed gorillas for uh, over 10 years now. So we know their behavior, we know how they react, we understand gorillas almost as well as we understand humans. And uh, when the silverback, so the dominant male of a group, dies, what happens is that the group completely disbands. Uh, the animals stay together in a group only because they want to stay with the silverback, the one individual that's central in the group. Uh, if you destroy all the, the silverback, if you remove it from the system, all the social bonds that exist connect actually these animals to the other animals 
And uh, so the, the remaining animals have no bond between them, or very little, very few. So the group disbands and the surviving individuals join other groups. That's what they do. A female doesn't want to, to, to live alone in the forest because they need the protection of a silverback. So what they do is that they join all the silverbacks. And of course, if they get infected in the process or if they're incubating, they will spread the disease uh, to other groups. So that's probably actually a very uh, important mechanism for Ebola to spread. And that reminds me uh, a little bit about uh, what Kat said earlier about um, uh, people are relieving the quarantine facility and uh, hiding in uh, other uh, households, right? And uh, the other way, very likely way, that Ebola spreads between uh, gorilla groups is that uh, gorillas have been observed touching or grooming dead gorilla bodies a lot. Uh, they actually are aware of what death means, I think. Uh, it's hard to say, of course, uh, it's quite precisely. But they definitely, uh, for example, a female who loses her infant is going to keep the corpse of her infant the body of her infant for several weeks sometimes, and uh, try to keep taking care of it. And uh, when an adult individual dies in a gorilla group, uh, the other individuals usually gather around this individual, touch it, and uh, groom sometimes the body, etc. So that's also very similar to what's observed in uh, human populations. Um, so after this study, uh, I also want to say that gorilla surveys done in the region that are unpublished, unfortunately, I didn't do this survey, um, but they showed that uh, a road stopped the eastward spread of the virus. So basically, we found out through the surveys that there were more uh, lower gorilla densities, actually very low gorilla densities, on the west side of the road. But if you cross the road, there are regular normal uh, gorilla densities, which means that there was probably a spread of the virus eastward, and then there was stopped it. So that's also another evidence that Ebola spreads spatially uh, through the population. So let's try to reconcile the multiple transmission hypothesis and the single outbreak hypothesis now. I think that the reservoir species, so fruit bats, maybe other species too, but at least fruit bats, likely host multiple Ebola strains. The reason why I'm saying this is because there is absolutely no reason it shouldn't. Uh, why would there be only one strain of Ebola in this host species? There's no reason for that. Some of these trends are pathog pathogenic, some are probably non-pathogenic, which explains the seroprevalence observed in a, a lot of populations of animals and humans that are where no uh, uh, Ebola outbreaks have been recorded. Once in a while, a gorilla or a chimpanzee eating fruit, probably at the same, same tree where the bats were, gets, gets infected by chance. It, has, it happens, it doesn't have to happen very often, but it happens once in a while by chance. Subsequently, the virus percolates, so it spreads through the gray population, and sometimes over tens of miles, uh, and over long periods of time, probably months. Uh, the outbreak I talked about lasted at least a year at one place. So if you look at a, a broader, a larger geographical scale, uh, this outbreak I was talking about probably spreads over um, a period of two, three, or four years, I don't know. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was the case. We don't have data for that. Um, and once gorillas are infected, uh, the virus becomes uh, much more available and accessible for human populations because humans kill wildlife to eat, obviously, and they kill gorillas and chimpanzees, uh, eat them sometimes, they kill monkeys, they kill tigers, etc., because they eat proteins. And that's how typically the virus uh, enters uh, villages. And then it spreads, as we all know, uh, between households. After a while, uh, human outbreaks stop. Uh, thank God they always stop. <laughs> due to quarantine, isolation measures, and, uh, and hopefully one day due to treatment and vaccination. And great outbreaks also stop due to either natural barriers that exist in the landscape, rivers, roads, you know, uh, also due to local decrease in gorilla density, maybe because the vegetation changes and it's not as good anymore. And um, so the virus can only spread if the gorilla density is high enough, obviously, because if the density is low, there's not, the, 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 the rate of contact between neighboring groups gets lower and that, does not uh, allow the virus to spread. Um, so this is what happens, and actually it's a loop. You could uh, uh, come back from here uh, to here, and uh, that happens again. And that happens every once in a while. Okay, every few years actually that happens. Uh, it's very rare, but whenever it happens, it's dramatic. It kills actually thousands and thousands of gorillas, and now it's actually killing also thousands and thousands of, uh, of humans. Um, I want to talk a little, a little bit about uh, how we can use this information to help controlling Ebola outbreaks. And uh, so the obvious way to control Ebola outbreaks is to, you know, sort of wait for them to happen and try to 
be very, very quick and be there at the beginning and set up quarantines and, and manage to uh, talk to the local population in a way that they uh, uh, collaborate and understand and change their behavior and then you know, stop the spread of Ebola in uh, human populations. But uh, I wish we could also prevent uh, human Ebola outbreaks from occurring in the first place. And um, actually there is a, probably a way to at least decrease the rate of uh, Ebola outbreaks occurring in, uh, in human populations. So first, I want to say here that the location of the next Ebola outbreak is unpredictable. Uh, you will find scientists once in a while who tell you that it is predictable, uh, but it's not. And some scientists who try to predict the next Ebola outbreaks were wrong. So I think now they would be a little bit more cautious, but we don't know where it will happen. It will happen probably in the forested area and you know, in West Africa, in Central Africa, maybe somewhere else. Uh, bats move a lot around, so we have no idea where the next Ebola outbreak would, outbreak would be. Uh, but we can reduce the probability of this outbreak, though. And uh, this is a picture I took actually recently in, uh, in Democratic Republic of the Congo. It's a hunter in the forest. He's doing something that hunters have not been doing for a long time. It's actually a very new thing. And uh, when you hear about uh, you know, uh, people telling you that uh, uh, hunting in the forest is part of the, the behavior or the culture of, uh, of people living in the forest in this area, it's only partially true. It is true that people have been hunting animals for a long time to eat and get proteins, that is true. But the scale of hunting that's observed now has nothing to do with what's been uh, uh, done historically. Uh, in the past, I would say two decades or so, the, 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 the bushmeat hunting has increased dramatically. There is much more killing hunting in the forest. And the reason why it has increased dramatically is because now the meat hunted is traded. So it does, it's not used, the animals that are killed are not used by the villagers or by the hunter and his family anymore. The hunter hunts and sells the meat in major cities. And you do find huge bushmeat markets in Brazzaville, in Kinshasa, in Libreville, in Franceville, in everywhere in Central Africa. You do find huge bushmeat markets in Kisangani, everywhere. And, um, and this is a new thing. So the scale of the bushmeat hunting has nothing to do with what's been historical. And I'm a conservationist. I want to protect gorillas, I want to protect wildlife, but I'm not against hunting. And I am against bushmeat trade. So I'm against this scale of hunting because I know it's completely unsustainable. And what is bad for the animals is also bad for the local populations. The local hunter who used to be able to feed his family and who now walks for days and days to go very deep in the forest and kill, like this person, eight monkeys in one day, he killed eight monkeys. He's going to sell them all. Maybe he will keep one for his family, I don't know, but that would be the last time because next time he goes to this area in the forest, there won't be any monkey anymore. Um, so we need to understand that the, the bushmeat crisis that's going on is a completely unsustainable uh, uh, activity and it has nothing to do with the culture, culture of local people who actually have been hunting forever. Um, and if you look at, uh, at this map here that was published in uh, Science a few years ago, uh, you can see, I'm sorry, the map is... Uh, a color pattern that's hard to read. Um, but you can see in red uh, new roads that have been uh, traced and uh, created in the forest in Central Africa. There's thousands and thousands of kilometers of miles of road that have been created since, uh, I would say, the, the 90s or early 2000s. And uh, this forest where I was uh, studying gorillas, so this clearing I showed you, uh, used to be extremely remote and would take me several days to get there and spend hours and hours on the pirogue. And now you can almost drive there. And uh, there are actually even roads going to northern Congo, which was one of the most remote areas in Africa. And uh, the reason why these roads are being built is because of logging. Logging companies create these roads, it's worth it, to be able to extract the wood and bring it back to the main uh, major cities where the wood is treated and exported to uh, to Europe uh, first, and uh, to Asia, and to the US. And we do use a tropical wood, as you probably know. And so that's definitely a big problem. When you buy tropical wood, when everybody buys tropical wood, we uh, finance the creation of these roads. When we finance the creation of roads, we finance movement of populations who can follow these roads to go bushmeat hunting and trade the meat. And uh, when they do this, actually, the people who have been in the forest forever, like the Bayaka pygmies, they end up living in an area where they cannot eat anymore. And uh, uh, last month, I was in the uh, Democratic Republic of the Congo, where a similar problem exists, not relating to logging, but relating to mining. There's a lot of mining activity, and therefore there is a lot of bushmeat hunting. And the people living in the small village next to uh, the, the research camp where I work uh, are starving now. They are, they are not starving because they don't have enough food, 
they, are, they suffer from malnutrition, and the children, uh, short after weaning, you know, after the age of two, when they start eating, uh, uh, where they should be eating meat and diversity of, uh, of uh, other sorts of, um, uh, of foods, uh, they only eat uh, cassava and uh, cassava leaves, and that's it. And uh, by the age of three or four, the immune system gets weak, they get you know, random diseases and they die. Uh, and they can also just die sometimes from malnutrition. And uh, so last month, the week before I arrived, two kids died in this tiny village. And it happens all the time. Each time I travel to this area, I hear about children dying from malnutrition because of the bushmeat hunting. So it's actually a really, really big problem. Bushmeat hunting has a, uh, impacts human populations in many, many ways. So malnutrition is one, Ebola is another one, other zoonoses also happen. And uh, it's definitely something that we can fight at our level too. Um, so I think Ebola is, a, is unfortunately a, a, an example uh, of the kind of um, uh, threats that are uh, currently ongoing for human populations everywhere in Africa. And uh, you know, Africa is going through dramatic demographic changes, dramatic cultural changes, but also dramatic ecological uh, changes and everything works together. Okay, the, the, the ecosystem has to be healthy as well as uh, human population. So it's really one health. <coughs> uh, thank you.